Hello, I'm Dr. Angie McCartney. And I'm Ruth McCartney. Welcome to T-Flix, where each episode's intimate conversation features a fascinating guest across the spectrum of Beatles world, pop culture, Grammy winners, the music industry, chefs, producers, music stars, actors, and more. So bottoms up and join us as they spill the tea on T-Flix. Hey, going live, and we are live. One minute late, thanks to uh, StreamYard and Facebook, having a little fight. Okay. But here we are. Happy Tuesday, our Tuesday little warriors. Hello, darlings. Glad you could join us. We have a very, very special guest today. Oh, yes. A lady full of stories. Yep. So this lady typed the lyrics to George Harrison's All Things Must Pass, and she is the Miss Odell of George Harrison's song written about her. She's the subject of Leon Russell's Pieces Apple Lady, a song he wrote to woo her. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, woo, woo. We'll, Ooh, woo. we'll have to hear about that. No. Um, she is the mystery woman pictured on the back of the Rolling Stones album Exile on Main Street as she worked as their personal assistant on that infamous 1972 tour. And she's the woman down the hall in Joni Mitchell's song, Coyote, about a love triangle on Bob Dylan's Rolling Thunder review tour. So without and further follow ado. Follow that, any of you. I dare you. Are you you're able to see us okay, Marts? We're live to the world. Yes? Yeah, hold on. Okay. I just mm-hmm. want to make sure that we don't uh, click the wrong button because StreamYard's giving me spiel this yeah, morning. Go. But we're good to go. And ladies and gentlemen, things drop out of the ceiling. Confetti and all kinds of champagne poppers go off for Miss Chris O'Dell. Good morning. Hello. Hi, Chris. Good morning. Good it's so good morning. to see you. to see you. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Great. Thank you for joining us. Where are you Where are you phoning in from today? I'm in Tucson. You know, get back. I took it literally. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's funny. I love that. To Tucson, Arizona. That was where our dear Linda breathed, breathed her last, I believe. Yes, right? that's right. Actually, I was with Mary Frampton the other day. She came to visit me and we drove out there uh, to where the where their branch was or yeah. is, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. That's wild. Mm-hmm. Ah, that's beautiful. So I mean, my God, where on earth do we start? So we were just talking a little bit before the show about how one evening you got in 1968 a call, a friend of yours called Alan. Uh phoned you up and told you that you absolutely had to get somewhere to the La Brea, what was it called? The La Brea Inn. What was that night oh. all about? Well, um, I was supposed to, Alan Ryder was, he later married the Bion, Bionic woman, so oh. that could have been me. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> he was just this really, I was working for this uh, record tip sheet that told radio stations what to play, what new singles. So I met all the promotion men and he asked me, we were going to go out somewhere. And he called and said late by the way. And he said, I'm at the La Brea Inn and there's a man here. I think you should meet. His name is Derek Taylor. Oh, wow. Works for the Beatles or he worked for, he was the Beatles press agent. And I went, no, nobody knows the Beatles. The Beatles don't exist. They're little stick men. This is, (laughs) You know, this can't be for real. But I and I, I fought him. And then he said, no, come over. So I did. I went to the La Brea Inn, which was right down the street mm-hmm. on La Brea from A&M Records, which is where Derek oh, yeah. had his office at that time. Right. So there were he would just gather. Derek gathered people, as you well know. Songs. Right. He always had people just kind of. Yeah. And um, so I went there and I met him and I was absolutely tongue-tied yeah he was hilarious he so, yeah, he but, yeah. yeah he's just indescribable indescribable as far as i'm concerned unless you knew him it's hard to tell talk about yeah. him. oh yes we knew him well yes mm-hmm. so that was my meeting with derek and um and then we just stayed friends and his wife and family joan had left to go back to london because he was going to work for apple then uh, mm-hmm. and so and he didn't drive not so unusual in England, very right. unusual in Los Angeles. Right. So I started driving him around to all of his meetings and dinners. And eventually I had to quit my job. Wow. Because I couldn't do both. So for a month, I drove him around. And during that period of time, he said, I think you should come to London. Cool. Yeah. How old were you? You'd be 19. Young. I was 19. 19. Just, to, just kind of going towards 20. So what did mom and dad think? Uh Uh-oh. 
Well, mom and dad were didn't really know all that until I told them I was moving. I went to, well, it took a long time for Derek to convince me. It took him at least two months <laughs> and <laughs> with phone calls. And um, they, you know, I don't think they understood, but I look back today and think they were amazing because they sold my life insurance policy to buy my airline ticket. Oh my wow. God. They took over payment of my car and drove me to the airport. Wow. Oh. And you yeah. sold your record collection, didn't you? That's what got me the money to really go was I had to sell, I got a hundred dollars for my record collection. Which oh my God, a hundred dollars. Wow. I know, but I had so many boxes of singles yeah. that, um, you know, it was hard to let go of those. I wish I still had them. Actually. Well, but you know, to go from going from thinking, gosh, I'm going to have to part with all these wonderful vinyl records to then a short while later sitting in the studio when they were recording the White Album and Abbey Road and, and Let It Be. And, you know, you sang, you get to sing on Hey Jude. I mean, come on. Yeah, if you put it that way, there's not really much more to discuss, is there, about that? Right. Elizabeth's just saying, bless your parents. Because, you know, yeah. back in those days, in the late 60s, it was all, it was very, kind of like it is now, divided. And as much as generationally, there were the, you know, the conservative people, and then there were the freaking hippies and the flower power people, right? So for your parents to say, come on, let's help you do this and live the dream. Yeah, it's quite something. It is quite something. And mm -hmm. and actually, when I decide to move to L.A., this is kind of how my parents were. And it's not that they were so liberal with me. They were very good and careful parents, but they didn't deny me my journey because when I said I was moving to L.A. and I was going to sell my I was going to take money from my uh, hair Sweet. hair cutting class I was taking, he, dad said, no, I'll drive you. Oh. So he drove me to L.A. So they were very they were really helpful in my in my getting out of my home and moving on into the world i think it was pretty amazing you're originally from oklahoma is that right well i was born in indiana my parents moved yeah. to oklahoma when i was about mm -hmm. one and then we moved to tucson when i was about 10 or 11. oh i see okay simon okay. weitzman's just popped on and said hello oh <gasps> my dearest Absolutely. <laughs> hi simon hi hi so <laughs> Oh, anyway, tell us, what was the sort of typical working day at Apple? What did you do? Anything? Well, once I got the job, it took a while. I mean, even though Derek brought me, I still had to find my own space there. Oh, yeah. And, and um, mm. I did eventually because I made, I got lunches. I decided to go out and get them. I would do the switchboard. I would sit in for the for Barbara O'Donnell, the secretary, when she would go on all the oh, lunches. Yeah. But I decided they were having sandwiches and I went, you know what? I think I could do better than that. So I went to the restaurants around in the West end around Whitmore street, which is yep. where Apple yep. was. Yep. And I asked them if I said, look, I work for the Beatles. Can I like have real meals on, on plates on China? Yeah. And, um, you know, so they did. And the, I mean, Neil Aspinall, they were also amazed that sooner Peter Asher finally said, would you be my assistant? Oh, wow. Okay. And he said, could you still get my lunches? And I went, okay. It's a very true saying that the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Oh, listen, yeah. I guess you're right. <laughs> That's right. God. Well, and, you know, I mean, imagine you're working in some little trattoria or whatever it was on Wigmore Street and in walks this, you know, hot chick with an American accent claiming she works for the Beatles. You're going to give her the plates just to see if you ever get them back. I mean, <laughs> You're going to give it a crack, aren't you? To yeah, see you got it. it. <laughs> and then, you know, if the plates come back, then you can brag that the Beatles ate off these plates. You know? <laughs> right? No kidding. I wonder if they ever used them again. Oh, Maybe they probably not. sold them for quids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, oh, used yeah. To, we used to sit in, at Rembrandt up at, at home in Heswell, and we would go to Birkenhead Market or Paddy's Market in Liverpool and buy – sheets that seconds you know they had like a run in them or something and we'd sit with pinking shears and cut them into like three inch squares 
and send them to the fans and say, you know, this is, we, we had to change Paul's sheets and he's getting new bedding and this, that, and the other, but he wanted you to have this. We used to buy gobs and buck bags of shirt buttons in sacks and trash yeah, bags. George Harrison's mother did too. She used to buy guitar strings and cut them into two inch pieces and, send them and to mail them to the fans. George was changing his strings this morning so and this broke, might like this. and he wanted you to have it. You know, we would sit for hours and hours and hours. Yeah, that's and, amazing. I'd never heard those stories. Yeah. Before. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But you know, towels and pillowcases and all kinds of yeah. stuff. So I'm um, I'm willing to bet they sold those plates as probably. <laughs> they probably did. Six. Yeah. This was '68. Absolutely. Yeah. They were still pretty pretty popular at that point. Yeah. Oh yes. So, so when you became um, Peter's assistant, what did what was sort of the the jet, that was where you would learn production, right? Or production assisting. Well, um, Peter was booking, he was looking for all the new artists. So we listened to all the tapes that came in. Mm -hmm. And then I did all the studio booking at Trident Studios because that was the major studio that right. the Apple artists used, not EMI. Yeah. Right. So uh, that's what I did mostly was booking sessions and, mm -hmm. and listening to tapes and writing letters saying, no, thank you. <laughs> no, it's tough. Yeah. I was turned before BMG signed me in 1988. I was turned down by 19 record companies, so I still have all the letters. It's you just got to hit the right person at the right day at the right time. Yeah, it happened to be in Germany, yeah. so we were on the road again. Yeah, I had to move to Munich to get my. my oh country. my goodness! Sorry, oh. for another day. Yeah. Another day. I did live in Germany for four years, by the way. Oh, whereabouts? In, well, I lived in, well, actually in Neu-Isenburg outside of Frankfurt, but my boyfriend was a promoter. And so I moved there and we did more tours. I did more touring in Germany for four yeah. years. My yeah. goodness. When you were at Apple, were the Apple scruffs around in those days? They definitely were. Um, were they okay with you? Um, yeah, they were fine. Sure, no. <laughs> you know, they were, the girls were nice. You'd see them everywhere. They were at EMI, they were at Paul's house, they were yeah. at Apple, mm -hmm. they were ever, Trident. I mean, yeah. they were part of the family as far as I was concerned. I still see some of them on yes. internet. Yeah. Facebook, yeah. Yeah, they're still around, yeah. God bless them. A little older and a little wiser as we all are. <laughs> yes, no kidding. Well, I just found a letter the other day. I'm not sure where I got it, maybe from um, uh, Mark Lewis, and I'm not really sure, that I wrote to Lizzie Bravo. Yeah. Uh-huh. Because apparently they had sung on, uh, someone says they sang on Across the Universe. They called them in from oh, the oh, great. They yeah. come in and sing. And so she wrote me a letter saying, when it's going to be, when's it going to be released? Wow. Very interesting. Speaking of release, our friend Sarah uh, Fish is asking, is your book still available? Your Miss it is on Amazon. Okay. It, um, it, they're still selling it. Believe me, it's unbelievable because it's been out since 09, I think. So yeah. right. you can still order it either audio or, well, I think any of them now are still mm -hmm. on Amazon. That's fantastic. They, I got a message this morning from Pamela Debar who said she'd met you some time ago. Yes, I did with her creative writing for herself. Yeah, yeah, yes. I did her creative writing thing for one night. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, she's actually on the road uh, doing. She does her goddess workshops. You know, she's the author. For those of you who don't know, she's the New York Times best-selling author of "I'm with the Band," and we actually have her booked at the Eighth Room, formerly Douglas Corner in Nashville, for her one night only, an evening with the ladies of rock and roll. Um, McCartney Studios presents. So you, you and I should talk about doing that with you. I love that. That's great. Yeah. Actually, I've been dying to get Pamela to do a thing with me where we can really talk about groupy stuff. Yes, because well, I, I'll reintroduce yeah. you. Yeah, that's always a, a top people who say, "Oh, you were a groupie," and it's like, so there's a whole big story around all of that. And I, I never thought I was, but there were girls who actually said, "Yes, I am." Yeah. yeah, well, some, I mean, Pamela has literally made a brand out of it. Her yeah. license plate is groupie, you know. Yes. <laughs> and, and in those days, you know, they, they were known as groupies. But now, looking back, you would think about it as more of a muse, right? You, inspiration for their mood and the songs and, you know, whether they would get out of bed and tour or not. I mean, the, there was a whole cadre of beautiful women who emotionally and sometimes physically supported these guys. And without us, without those women, I don't mean me, me. but I mean the female form, mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Who knows what would have happened? They'd have just, you know, stayed in and grown their toenails, wouldn't they? <laughs> Absolutely. They were extremely valuable to the music, actually. Absolutely. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, uh, well, okay, I won't talk about my documentary. We talk a little about that. Yes. I was to say so. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would love to hear more about that. Um, Karen, our friend from Edinburgh, is asking, how good was it be, was it to be at the show on the rooftop? Uh, when asked what is the one gig you would love to have seen, his answer is always to have been on that rooftop, sat beside Alan Parsons. How how did that day all unfold? Because Billy Preston was there, and they were all just there. How did it how did it come to be that they went on the roof? From my point of view, they talked about going a lot of places, including the Grand Canyon, which I was very much for being from Arizona. I thought, well, that's cool. The Beatles at the Grand Canyon. Wow. Um, but eventually, it, I think a lot to do with George, from what I gather. No, he didn't want to travel. He didn't want to do it. So they agreed on the roof. But the roof was not very strong. Right. The girl, we girls used to sunbathe up there whenever there was sun, which wasn't often. And um, so my office was, Peter and my office offices were right below the roof. I mean, we're on the top floor. Uh -huh. So we saw them putting up all the supports and the beams and everything and taking stuff up there. And, but we also got a memo saying no employees were allowed up there. Oh, It just wasn't safe enough. Right. God. But being the American that I am, I... <laughs> Had, a girl. <laughs> I had made friends with the camera crew and Tony Richmond, the cameraman came up and said, come up. And I said, no, I can't need you. Yeah, you're, you're my assistant. So he took me up there. Little did I know there were only seats for four people. It was yep. like, my recollection is a bench, but some people say it was seats. I, I remember a bench. So I sat right near the near the roof, the, over the, the side. Cause I wanted to see what the people on the street were going to do. Yeah. Right. And you could hang on to the chimney if it all went south. <laughs> oh my gosh. I see myself lean over now and think I would never do that today. No, oh, God. God. <laughs> so, and then eventually Ken Mansfield who worked for Apple at Capitol records and then Maureen and Yoko. So we were actually the only four people who had a seat on the roof. Oh, good God. And it was exhilarating. It was, they sounded amazing. Mm -hmm. But most importantly, it was freezing cold. I was going to say, it was oh, yes. for, 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 for a reason, yeah. wasn't it? There is no way to describe because the wind was blowing. And you know that cold. It was what, January 29th, January 30th? Yeah, something yeah. Like January 30th, it, I think. I can't remember. Yeah. Well, but, end of January. Who knew it would be? I mean, who knew it would end up being what it is today, as iconic yeah. as it is? Wow. Yeah, just incredible. Mm -hmm. Um, Karen is also saying one other place that they are apparently discussed was Primrose Hill, and that's uh, full circle. That's my nephew James McCartney's new single, it's called Primrose Hill. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. They did talk about that when yeah. we used to occasionally go stay um, in Cavendish Avenue. Uh, in London, Paul and I would go to Primrose Hill with Martha, the dog, and, you know, walk out. He loved that place. I think that's where he got the inspiration for Fool on the Hill. Fool on the Hill. I and do that too. and the Maharishi somewhere came, became Fool on the Hill. But yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's great that Primrose Hill is still an, a green open space in a built up city. That's I that. always think of Primrose Hill in relation to Ray Connolly. Do you know Ray? I do. Yeah. Ray, yeah. Ray wrote the foreword to my the book I've just released. There are faces and, I remember. Oh, bless him. He had a dreadful bout with COVID oh. and he was really, really ill. He yeah. lost his memory. He had to learn to speak again. He had um, what, a tracheotomy. For a while. Uh, he's yeah. okay now. He's okay. Uh, yeah. But yeah, no, Ray's, a really Ray's bad a lovely deal. man. But he's back and writing again. Why does Primrose Hill remind you of Ray? Uh, because he and Plum used to live there. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's oh, right. That's Still do. Uh, don't they still no. live in the same house? No, no, no they, they moved. don't. Oh, yeah. okay. Anyway, we're getting yeah. in the weeds. Anyway, I'll write to him today and tell him all about this. So mm -hmm. um, you returned to the States in 72 and you were hired because, again, Derek was such a, a den mother, if you will. He would introduce anybody to anybody. Yeah. And a hilarious. You came back to the States at the end of the Beatles, right, in 72 and went to work for the Rolling Stones. Yeah, not to be, out, not to be outdone. You know. How's that for name dropping? Well, 
<laughs> you know what I always say? If you've got the Beatles as the first list on your resume, where do you yeah. go? You can only yeah. go down, right? I will, yes. <laughs> Actually, I was after I worked for Apple, um, I went I helped out Derek and the Dominoes for a little bit in London while they were forming and going crazy. And then I went back to to L.A. to work for Peter. He he brought me back to be well, not. Yeah. For him, for his Peter Asher management. So I, I worked for him for about a year and then I got an offer with the Stones. Poor Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, it just life goes on, right? You have to you have to follow your heart and take your your parents' uh, lessons. That you just go go be go do, you, yeah. go be Chris. You yeah. Know? yeah, I could never have not done that. That was quite an exciting. I it, bet. Yes. Yeah. They're just and, amazing. And so you were you were doing essentially what you were doing at Trident and and Apple, right? Was booking the sessions for Exile on Main Street. Um, when I was working in uh, for the for the Stones, you mean? Yeah. Yes. When I worked for them, we were in L.A. I got them homes in L.A. They were spending probably it was about six months. I keep thinking it was a year. It felt like a year. And I bought I got them homes and then I spent every day at Mix House and they were finishing Exile. So I did all the lyrics, uh, typed all the lyrics. I was really good at typing lyrics at that point. And here's the thing. George made it easy. He handed me the written lyrics. The Stones, I had to sit and listen to every track and try to figure it out. What oh, they wow. so with, time with, with mixed pronunciation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I have the lyric sheets where he had to make corrections. <laughs> oh, wow. That's crazy. Yeah. And when I hear Mick now, it sounds like Mick doing an impersonation of Mick. <laughs> That's <laughs> funny. That's funny. I didn't see them on, I haven't seen, I'm not going to see them on this tour. I said, I've seen enough. Yeah. You can only but you know, them. you've got to hand it to these guys in the eighties and they're still rocking, still doing it. Excuse me, 94. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm still doing uh, it. I mean, you're not, you're not out touring, but you no, know, not yet. No. Writing books and running a tea company and oh. CBD and wine and, Writing limericks and doing oh yeah, all but that's of... a sitting down job. Oh well, you know that's yeah. Uh, that's... Uh, but you're not laying down. That's the main point. You're oh, sitting... not anymore. <laughs> I know. I mean, arguably, Ringo Starr's got a sitting down job, but you know, he's still getting it done. Yeah, right. I know. Yeah, <laughs> that's crazy. So then, through I guess it would be through your connections with Peter, and it's really a small business, isn't it? Rock and roll. When you when you're in a, a click, it's it's you know one begets the other begets. It's like a Rolodex game of Rolodex. So how did you get involved with, say, Crosby, Stills, and Nash? Well, I had done the Stones tour, and in all transparency, afterwards, I had to get off drugs and alcohol. Okay, <laughs> good. Back, 72. I'll, I'll drink to that. Good for I'll you. Drink, I wish I were drinking to it. Um, so I, my friend owned a travel agency, Journeys Far and Near, and I went to work for her and we started developing these great itineraries that nobody would really had before. And mm -hmm. Bill Graham's office loved it. And so they called me and said, do you want to go on Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young tour that we're doing? And I went, yeah, sure. So uh -huh. that was actually the first tour. I, I toured with the Stones, but as the assistant to the Stones, not as a tour person. Right. So that was the beginning of my touring career so to speak. There wouldn't have been many women in tour management, in rock and roll tour management in those days. Yeah, There were a few that were like tour managers or traveling with musicians smaller, but these were huge tours. We're talking over a hundred people on the tours Bill Graham did in the early 70s. So um, definitely I was probably the first one to have ever operated on that level of touring. Mm -hmm. Because it's semis of equipment and buses of people and people who we didn't have cell phones or fax machines or let alone even Motorola beepers yet, right? We did it all by hello. <laughs> yeah, right. And, and knocking knocking on hotel doors and standing there with ice buckets if they came to the door sleepy and the bus was ready to go. <laughs> you got it. You got it. We did it. that in England with a few bands that shall remain nameless because they turned out to be nasty people. But um, yeah, to it, man, it's it's the old herding cats, isn't it? But it's herding cats with guitars. Totally, and lovely people. Musicians oh, are yeah. wonderful. They're absolutely lovely, yeah. but they live a different lifestyle. 
Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Our friend, back to the Primrose Hill thing for a second. Karen in Edinburgh is quite the, uh, I don't know whether it's an anthropologist or what you would call it, but Archibald Primrose was the first Earl of Midlothian in Scotland and whom the hill is named after is a 12th cousin of the McCartneys. Wow. Oh, that is well. Thank, you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Remember you heard this year. Isn't that wild? Yeah. Who knew? Crazy. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> so um, you returned to the States. You're now back here. You've done the Exile on Main Street tour and whatever. Um, and at some point, um, May Pang. Yep. Well, yeah, she was telling me that when she and John were staying in Santa Monica on their last weekend trip, that you came to visit and you stayed with them. Yeah, I came for a night and never left. <laughs> the thing that wouldn't That's leave. That yeah. is the fun part of it, isn't it? When you're like, okay, I think I'll just stay here. Well, yeah, I was well, living in LA, so literally I had a flat in the valley. But I, but they were in Santa Monica at Peter Lawford's house. That's yes. right, yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, I spoke to her last week and she said, oh, do ask Chris about our, our, <laughs> our time together in Santa Monica. It so was. She, some of it she'll be able to tell you and some of it you won't. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, there's truth to that. But it was actually a really good time because, you know, they talk about the last weekend, last weekend okay. being um, like John was totally out of it. That is not true. He was at the beginning, and then when they started doing the Pussycats album, Harry Nielsen's album, yeah. John really just quit doing any everything more oh, or less. Good. And up early in the morning, we'd all lay by the pool and wait for Keith Moon to come out in his Nazi gear and salute. <laughs> yeah. There were a lot of people at that house staying. Um, and it was actually a really, really interesting really interesting time i bet it was yeah. yeah and a lot happened i mean did we go out and uh, now i'm not saying everybody was straight and clean no i think john was that may have and may because may remembers she's the only person who remembers everything actually <laughs> she's still not much of a not much of a drinker you can't you can't get it no, maybe, maybe at a wedding you know <laughs> she was at my house when she did the gallery thing a few months back and someone yeah. gave her a bottle of champagne it's downstairs in my little storage cabinet. I'll be right. I'll be, I'll be right, right there. there. We'll come and get I'm it. Over. I should have brought it out. No, she was delighted when she knew you were going to come on our little tea flick show. So, do you know? Do you happen to know how they wound up? I mean, what was this? Nineteen seventy-three. Three. Three. Was, Pete, was Peter Lawford still alive? Did he still own the house? Oh, absolutely. In fact, why would he rent it out to a bunch of maniacs? Well, he wasn't living. It was he lived in town off Sunset Boulevard. We went to his place to play pool quite often, actually. And I think John was there. Ringo was there. John was going to record, and they were all at the Beverly Wilshire. And I think Peter said, "Well, I got a house on the beach. Why not? Why don't you just go stay there?" That's the way I figured. I wow. wow! So they went, and it was a beautiful house. The thing about the house that was so I've been there. Crazy. Have you been there? Yeah. Well. Yeah. It was gorgeous. And of course, it was where Marilyn Monroe had her affairs with the Kennedys. That's, uh, yeah. That's right. Oh, boy. Quite the legendary piece of real estate, I'd say. No kidding. Yeah. Well, uh, and, yeah. and steps from a wonderful beach cafe now. So you could you could get breakfast and ride the bike path and tell the story. I wonder, wonder who owns it now or if it's an Airbnb, because that's got to be one of the most legendary houses outside, you know, the Aussie and Harriet house and the Brady Bunch house. That's going to be one of those legendary places in LA. I think I haven't been by it in a long time. It was there at one point. Yeah, we were, I, I was there probably four or five years ago. So I don't know if it's been remodeled or, or what have you, but good grief. Yeah. Paul Moody is, is on, he's, he's our friend. He lives on the beach here down in Playa del Rey and he knows all about the, all the old beach real estate. His, um, late mom was a big jazz fan and she knew all the jazz musicians in town and there would be these beach hangouts and these jazz things, which was fantastic. So she, I'm, I'm sure Mrs. Moody probably knew all of those same people, you know, yeah. birds yeah. of a flock together. Didn't Paul and Linda come and visit there? 
-huh. They did indeed. In fact, it's uh, May has the iconic photo of the last time they were they were John and Paul were actually photographed together. Oh, mm -hmm. really? Yeah. Um, they showed up. It was a time when things were not so great. Yeah. yeah. And so it was a big deal that they were coming. I think we all, it's like, you know, when you find out the principal's going to come to your class and look, yeah. we all yeah. got in our best clothes and some of us made yeah. it really <laughs> quiet and kind of so that they could all, t all, so they could hang out and talk. That's wild. Yeah. Oh, Paul is just saying his mom, Jeannie, used to swim with Peter Lawford out in the Santa Monica Bay yeah. here. So you see, talk about full circle, small world. Yeah, I love you, it. That's you great. stayed at his house and he's watching your show. <laughs> hey, we're not off doing some name dropping today, are we? We are. I'm going to have three hernias and a back brace to pick all these names up. <laughs> <laughs> crazy. What's another crazy um, either studio or tour story that springs to mind? Oh, my gosh. There's so many different ones. Um, I know that that Angie was saying something that Mary uh, May had mentioned when she and I went to buy a bathing suit when we were living, when we were staying at the at the house, I didn't have a bathing suit. And of course, yeah. I was going to drive all the way to the valley to pick one oh. up. In my yeah. flat. So we decided to go shopping. So we got in my little yellow Toyota, whatever it was, went somewhere in Santa Monica, close to Venice. And we were... I. Parallel, I parallel parked and I opened the door. And as I opened the door, there was a huge bang crash. Mm. And I looked and there was this guy on the ground on a bicycle. Oh, shoot. And I'm like, oh, my God. So, of course, the police came. Now, he said he was OK. We helped him up, put him on the curb and the police came. And I could I didn't have my driver's license. Oh. I looked and looked and looked and I said, I don't have my driver's license now. This man was from uh, Mexico or somewhere like that. In the end, they should have ticketed me and they didn't. And May and I felt so bad that the police were actually giving me, letting me go when I should have actually had to pay the consequences. But the guy was faking the concussion. Anyway, we stuck his bike and him in my car and drove him home. We felt so bad. <laughs> yeah, but isn't that sad though that the police would automatically give the white person a pass. That is exactly what happened. Not the wrong person. Yeah. And it, it upset both May and I were like, we were, so we go back to the beach and John and, and Ringo and everyone are out by the pool and we sit down and we're going, Oh my God, we've just had this terrible experience. And May said, yeah, we're afraid this guy is going to sue Chris. And John went, yeah, don't worry. Everybody's suing me. <sighs> And that was the end of the conversation. Typical, <laughs> typical Lennon. Like, I, yeah, I, I, I see your bike accident. I raise you Apple lawsuits. Exactly. <laughs> Karen's asking, Chris, I understand the song Pisces Apple Lady is an ode to yourself. It's a great song. What's the, um, what's the backstory? And, and is that, I know that's told in your book, which is still available on Amazon. And do you, do you get the time in your forthcoming documentary to talk about things like that? Um, you know, somewhat not to, yes, the answer is yes, but not to a great length. It's, we had a lot to talk about on that documentary, let me tell you. Um, and if Simon's here, he will still, he will know if we did, cause he's probably seen it a million times. Leon Russell came to Apple with Denny Cordell, who was, um, a producer who did Procol Harum and the Moody Blues. And, um, he must've liked me. Because uh, we went out a few times and I went, yeah, I don't think I need an American. I'm an English guy. I was looking for Englishmen, not Americans. And I kept getting set up with Americans. <laughs> James Taylor. So I'm like, okay. So anyway, I go to the studio the night he's leaving and he sings this song, Pisces Apple Lady, right before he was leaving to go back. And I went, oh, he likes me. He really, really likes me. He really likes me. He should, have told, he should have told him the the way to let him down gently is you let him give you half the publishing. <laughs> <laughs> Darn. You know what? All those songs and no money. I'm Patty and I need to sit down and work this one out. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I went back with Leon to L.A. for a while. So that was the story of Pisces Apple Lady. It was lovely. First song anyone wrote for me. The one and, one and only time I met Leon Russell was on a New Year's morning. It would have been the early 70s at my other stepbrother, Mike McGeer McCartney's house. Mm -hmm. There had been a big um, 
McCartney family New Year's Eve shindig the night before. And um, people, you know, at our house, we were, we were the, got the turn for that year. And Billy Connolly was there. He jumped out of the upstairs, my upstairs bedroom window with a little tiny parachute from a cornflakes box. <laughs> Oh, no. Not a, yeah, yeah, he was okay. He landed on the gravel driveway. It wasn't very far, so the window had a, like a little dormer thing down it, you know, like a little Swiss chalet. So he probably only jumped seven or eight feet, but, you know, whatever. And um, so they decided to cart Leon, decided to cart Billy Connolly back to Mike McGear's house. And um, there was really kind of nowhere to sleep. That There were bodies all over the place. So we went down the next morning with all the leftover you know, we made like a strata, I guess you'd call it, a bread pudding out of, we had eggs and we had dessert and we had Christmas cake and we had sausage and we had all kinds of stuff. So we made this big tray of stuff and took it down to Mike and Angie's house. And um, Leon Russell opened the door and he was kind of like squeaked like that. I said, are you okay? Because I'm a kid, I'm 12 or something. I said, are you okay, Mr. Leon? And he's like, yeah. He said, I had to sleep in one of the baby's prams. <laughs> he can't. <laughs> He curled up in Benna's pram because it was the only place to sleep. Oh, I remember, my gosh. I remember thinking, don't you think the floor might have been a better option? Yeah. That, that wasn't the only surprise of the morning. Um, on the way out, we go, and there's Billy. It's January 1st in Merseyside. It's f f f freezing. And Billy Connolly is standing with a huge extension cord and the hoover, the vacuum, in the middle of the lawn in a pair of red and white boxer shorts and his yellow banana boots and nothing else. Oh. And he's trying and sunglasses and he's trying to vacuum, vacuum up the snow. the snow because it's blinded him and he's got a hangover. Oh, stop it. That's hysterical. And Leon is standing at the door accepting this, you know, baked whatever it was, didn't seem to think there was anything unusual about that at all. <laughs> Yeah, they don't make him like that anymore. No, I, no, I love Billy Conley. I don't know how many Americans really know of him, but boy, oh, he's he an was, absolute genius. I thought he was the funniest man ever. Yeah, yeah dude. real sweetheart. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. for real. And that is absolutely wild. And Sammy, our friend in Atlanta, saying, I couldn't love Billy Connolly more if I tried. I know. <laughs> exactly. He's an absolute genius. He was the one, he, he used one of my favorite lines. He said, Well, I recently celebrated my. 55th birthday I treated myself to a nice bubble bath he said I laid there and I laid there and the bubbles dissipated and then I became depressed I looked down at my business <laughs> and he says and there he was lying there like a wee mouse nestled in shredded newspaper <laughs> <laughs> I'm like only Connolly would come up with a description of his block and tackle like a wee mouse nestled in shredded newspapers. Uh, that is. Oh, if you leave a man in a room alone with a tea cozy, I defy him not to swear. Put it on. No, not to try it on. Yeah, either yeah. here or there or somewhere. Yeah. Never leave a never leave a grown man, man alone with a tea with cozy. With a tea cozy. What a one. wonderful what man. Guy. What a man. What? Uh, Jeff, we, We've, between us, we've had a few adventures here and there, I reckon, don't you, Chris? I think so. One or two, yeah. I think uh, one or two, yeah. We were very fortunate to have lived in a really uh, nice time, a really yeah. great time, don't you think? Yes. I do, too. Oh, I absolutely yeah. do. Yeah. So scrolling across the bottom here, we so people can learn more about you, we have your website, which is very, very easy, missodell.com. And the documentary will be out probably Q3. It'll, it'll be out before the fourth quarter, we would hope. But not to make Simon Weitzman break into a sweat, we won't say an exact date just yet. No, but when we know, we'll give it plenty of promotion. Absolutely. Okay. Ashley, Ashley's saying in, in Birmingham, Alabama, isn't that the proper place for a tea cozy? <laughs> Boy, we're <laughs> spilling the tea today. Uh, behave yourself. This is... <laughs> it's a family show. Family show, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and you are going to be at uh, Beetle Week in Liverpool, are you not? I am. I'm first of August. I'm doing the Chicago Beetle Fest, and oh, then wow. I'm going to yeah Liverpool. I am so that is most exciting to me. Yeah. Anything because um, I've never been. I've been to Liverpool the one time, as I was saying, or maybe twice. I think I went with Mal once. Um, but I'm excited to go back there and see it and do the well, Beetle Week. I've never been to Beetle Week. So. It's fantastic. It's great. Yeah. Uh, so I, I will, uh, of course, you know Frida Kelly, right? So yes. she'll, she'll oh, naturally. Just, I just met her in New York this year. Oh, really? Oh, my gosh. Never met. I couldn't well, believe it. 
we'll make sure that you guys have all of each other's numbers and get to have a cup of tea. And um, we'll, you know, if you don't already know John Keats and Bill Heckle um, and cabin. Shannon, the artist who is best friend, they own the Cavern Club, uh-huh. um, along with Julia Baird, John's half sister. So we'll we'll set you up a, uh, we'll give you an old fashioned Rolodex for your Liverpool. I show. love it. Yeah. Thank you. I oh, would love that. that. Yeah. Uh, that's mm-hmm. that's great. So yeah, everybody's saying. Uh, thank you for a lovely chat. And uh, Ashley, our friend Ashley Davey, who is also a good friend of Frida's, will be uh, going to Liverpool. So make sure you get grab a coffee or a cup of tea with, with Ashley. Yeah, we put you and, on. Um, looking for you, Ashley. Yeah, we we'll, say he's, hi. He's great. Um, we'll we'll make sure your dance card is plentiful. How's that? Thank you. I love it. You guys are wonderful. Oh, oh you too. Hello. And, you know, we're all still here to tell the tale. That's the most important part. That's the important thing. This is us putting history on record. Yep, that's right. That's the right, right way. Yeah. And what I, one of the things I love you saying today was that, you know, during the, the latter part of the last weekend, and May gets a lot of flack for sort of stealing John and keeping him Mm-mm. rolling on drugs and alcohol and whatever. But, you know, he straightened out during that time. He was, he was productive. He was happy. He was yes. he was our John Winston. And she know. was also effective in getting him to commu- uh, communicate with Julian. Again. Reconnect with Julian. She absolutely. Really, absolutely. That situation you know, along. You know. I, I knew John. When I met John, he had just started with, with Yoko. They were actually not even public yet, press yeah. well. But that period of time when May was with him was the time that I found him so much more approachable, so much more at ease, so much less sort of mm-hmm. out there. I just, yeah, he was wonderful. Absolutely. So Angie got a letter this week from uh, Queen Camilla of England requesting a copy of her latest Liverpool limericks and other random Irish haikus book for the Royal yeah. Reading Library. So thrilled, yeah. And um, Martin and I were actually, we're out to lunch around the corner and the ring doorbell goes off and it's the, it's the mailman going, uh, signature required. I'm like, ooh, that's never good. <laughs> oh, that's never a good thing. And we came home and he came back, God bless him. And it was a personally hand signed and scribed letter from oh. Queen Camilla asking Angie for a, a copy of her limerick book. Um, which Is that it there? Yeah. Um, show us. Yeah, so, yeah. no, 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 it's available on Ms. McCartney's tease.com. No, so I mean right. Camilla's letter. Oh, oh yeah, yes. I'll, it's I'll actually, copy it to you. I'll send you yeah. a copy. Yeah. 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 And yeah. so um, Paul Moody, above above most people on this show, is always hangs around for the limerick. For the limerick. Uh, only yeah. our very special guests get one. And you get two verses. Two verses. Because we couldn't fit you into one. <laughs> so, right. are you ready? I am. A one, one two, two, three. three. In, in the, the halls, halls of Apple, Apple she shone. Chris O'Dell and her legend have grown. With Beatles and Stones and Dylan's deep tones, her presence in music was known. And today we enjoyed Miss O'Dell with musical memories to tell. She told us some stories of rockers' past glories. So thanks, Chris. It really was swell. Oh, my God, that is so amazing. Thank you. Hey, Simon, that should be included in our documentary somewhere. Okay. We'll, we'll film it. We'll film it for you. Okay. That was lovely. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. So, darling, everybody, you. keep your eyes peeled. Go follow Chris on all of her social media and uh, go register for her newsletter at missodell.com. And um, my, Simon's saying, we'll, we, we just made the end credits in their film. Yay! Okay, that's better than nothing, right? A fantastic <laughs> idea. It's better than nothing, yeah. I that's love it. Okay, yeah, we're going to do that. That's good. Yeah, It'll be in the credits. I love it. So, yeah, go follow Chris and stay tuned. If you're going to Liverpool, I'm sure her uh, public appearances will be, you know, notified all over the place by the, by the Fab Beetle Week people. We love you lots. Thank you for yes. spending. I know how busy you are with this film. So thank you for spending so much time with us today. Oh, and I it will be uh, posted later on this afternoon on McCartney.com. We will feature you on the front page. Thank you. All Bye. right. Bye-bye. God bless. Thank we'll you. see you soon. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to Tea Flicks and check out Dr. Angie's books, Organic Teas and CBD at Mrs. McCartney's Teas.com. Toodle pip!